I never like to go into the world of the occult, and that's where we're going, without a word of prayer. Can we unite our hearts before the Lord in prayer? Our Father, eternal God, we pray thee that the power of thy Holy Spirit may touch us as we now open thy word. We pray that thou would protect us from the wicked one and all his influence and power. Thou would direct our mind to thy word, fill us with thy Holy Spirit. Help us to see clearly thy will. Lord, give us discernment and open the scriptures to us that we may see the Lord Jesus Christ, that we may see people, hundreds of millions of them, caught in false doctrines and teachings, that we may reach out to them in his name. These things we ask of thee, confident that greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. In Jesus' name, amen. In the time that we have together, it's impossible to do justice to what is known as the doctrine of reincarnation. But today, through the writings of various cultic and occultic organizations, through emphasis by Edgar Cayce's Association of Research and Enlightenment, Gene Dixon, who has written that we are about to see an explosion of great psychic benefits through the discovery of the secrets of reincarnation, through individuals such as Jess Stern, who has written on the secret lives of Taylor Caldwell, the psychic lives of Taylor Caldwell, through the influence of such Eastern religious sects and movements as Mayor Baba, the Self-Realization Fellowship, Scientology, Spiritism, Theosophy, Ekinkar, Ruth Montgomery's writings, all about us on every side, sensational presentations in national magazines, and polls which indicate that more than 60% of the American populace believes in one way or another in the possibility, if not the high probability, of reincarnation. The Christian Church has to take a hard, analytical look at what is called evidence and at the fact of biblical revelation concerning it. I suppose we ought to begin by talking about what we mean when we use the term reincarnation. It's not to be confused with transmigration. Transmigration is the old Hindu doctrine that you have cyclic rebirth in various forms. Animals, any type of rebirth can occur depending upon the activities you have gone through in your past existence. You can end up a clam or a sea slug, or you can end up in a higher form such as man. This is all operative through what is known as the law of karma. But reincarnation is re-embodiment in another body. The Eastern mind will accept transmigration. The Western mind finds it extremely difficult. So reincarnation, when we hear of it in the West, is actually a redefinition of transmigration. They're talking about coming back again through cyclic rebirth. Only it's coming back in human form. The Unity School of Christianity and Theosophy have popularized this, as has Edgar Cayce's writings and the Association for Research and Enlightenment. So the Western mind gets transmigration lightly sprayed with some Eastern concepts and pass off to us as something new. Actually... It isn't new at all. What we're facing is an old doctrine shorn of some of the things which would turn us off on it and dressed up to look as if it is new and attractive. But if we're going to analyze it, we have to understand that reincarnation and transmigration are in essence the same thing, only two forms of it. One for the Eastern mind, one for the Western mind. Now, having traveled extensively in the East, I have come in contact with people who believe in transmigration. I have watched people very carefully lift bugs off themselves and put them down on the pavement and not destroy the bug because they want to be sure that they are not stepping on great-grandmother or great-grandfather. I have seen them refuse to eat meat and permit their children to starve because the cow is sacred and you might be destroying someone 
who lived in a previous life and has now reached the stage of a cow. The same is true in other areas of Eastern culture and civilization. The rats, for instance, are permitted to eat just hundreds of tons of food up. And yet you can't kill a rat. And the reason you can't is because it might be a relative or someone else. Now, we won't talk about relatives who are presently alive. We are talking about those who have, to use the expression, passed on. But when we are talking about reincarnation in the transmigration concept of the East, that's what you're talking about. When you talk about it in the West, you're talking about a person coming back in the form of another human being. Now, that doesn't mean that it can't happen in the East, because there are cases recorded where it does occur. And we're going to touch on some of that this evening. But the origin of reincarnation, very ancient, is found in the Hindu Vedas and also in most of the ancient pagan religions. The reason why people gravitate towards it is because it tends to solve some of the problems that they feel they cannot solve any other way. So when we are dealing with reincarnation, we're dealing with people who are committing to a very ancient idea, trying to solve some of the problems which they are facing today. When you go into evidences of reincarnation in our day, inevitably it is tied up in some form or other with hypnosis. You will read in the newspapers, just recently here, we had an instance of a minister's wife who was regressed, that is, went back through her life under hypnosis, until, to the surprise of everybody, she suddenly started to recount her past existence in Germany. She spoke German fluently, which she did not know when she was normally conscious. And the newspapers played it up as an illustration contemporary illustration of reincarnation. Various pulp magazines, other types of material, particularly motion pictures and things such as uh, On a Clear Day uh, and uh, other types of television programs have highlighted the concept of reincarnation. People like the idea, somehow or other, that they may have lived before. And they talk about, have you ever been to a place that you know you have never really ever been to, and yet you are absolutely positive that you have been there? How many people have had that experience? Now, a portion of the audience puts up their hand. How many of you have met a person that you could have sworn you knew before? Another group of hands go up. Now, all of these are taken as evidence of a previous life. However, it has been demonstrated by a very thorough scientific investigation that the human memory is a remarkable mechanism and that the memory banks store everything, including all the excessive garbage that we wish we could forget. And nine times out of ten, people who are tested with these kinds of ideas can regress to where the idea originated, a picture they saw, a person who reminded them, something that they experienced previously, not in a reincarnation, in their own life now. And it has been buried subconsciously, and then later on, they meet a person who looks like that person. A piece of territory or landscape that looks like that, a house that resembles that house. And the mind, which is constantly playing tricks on us, reassociates and reorganizes the material so that you think you have been there before. These are good scientific explanations of how our memory system works. But there are some things that cannot be explained away quite so easily. I don't know whether you're aware of it or not, but right now scientists are studying reincarnation and through parapsychology, all of the things connected with it. In fact, parapsychology has now been accepted by the American Association for the Advancement of Science and is being utilized on more than 100 college campuses and university campuses in the United States. What is parapsychology? Para, alongside of in Greek, psychology, the study of the mind, is actually a search into the mind or into the soul, going along with it 
It's not truly scientific, it's pseudo-scientific. But because they have produced such results in terms of psychic phenomena, the American Association for the Advancement of Science thinks that it is a bona fide field of investigation and inquiry. And it's going on right now. Now, one of the things that we read about constantly, connected with reincarnation, are the cases of children who can remember at a very early age having lived before. When I was preparing this particular lecture and research on it, covering a period of years, and we stacked up literally hundreds of books and clippings and filing cabinets filled with data and reports on things of this nature, I was struck by the fact that there were common characteristics in all of these things. I was delighted to see that the University of Virginia's parapsychology department had been doing exactly the same thing. And Dr. Ivan Stevenson came out after examining hundreds of cases of children who allegedly had previous lives with the following statement, quote, I don't think we have proof of reincarnation. Nothing like certainties. Close quote. There is a great believer in reincarnation who holds a doctor's degree, Dr. Sermonara, who says that reincarnation is actually, quote, the theory of reincarnation, I'm quoting now, is really the familiar scientific theory of evolution on a psychological and cosmic level, close quote. So what we are seeing now taking place on the level of reincarnation in our own country is to tar it with the brush of evolution. This, of course, makes scientists very happy and accepts many of the things that science has been attempting to foist upon the minds of the unwary. Now, I'm not going to go into a lengthy discussion on the theory of evolution because that's a totally different subject. But it's significant that the theory of evolution is now being tied to the theory of reincarnation. As the development of the body takes place from simple to more complex forms, so also what is taking place, say the reincarnationist, is the development of the soul from simple to more complex form through various cycles of reincarnation. Now hypnosis, which is a very ancient yoga practice, has been utilized to regress people so that they are able to talk about their past lives. And there have been some remarkable things occur in connection with this. One of the cases which I have spent some time analyzing, and which I think is worthy of analysis, was validated not too long ago in our newspapers and by the Indian Association of Parapsychology. I have checked this, and I want to give you the highlights of a case of reincarnation which apparently defies all scientific explanation. I'd like you to listen for just one moment to it. Quote, Professor Hamandara Nath Banerjee investigated not too long ago the case, and he did this over a six-month period, of a young girl who, at the age of two, began to speak about, quote, my husband. He is a very bad man. He killed me. I have a hole in my stomach. Close quote. The parents of the child were a little disturbed. They thought that the child was fantasizing. The child began to develop and grow. They became more exercised because the child began to describe things. Some of the things the child began to describe upset them even more. These are the things that the child was able to to say by the time she was six. She knew in detail the events of a previous life. She claimed that she had lived and had been murdered by her husband in a town far removed from the present location of the child's home. She knew in detail events of the slain woman's domestic life that only the dead woman or her closest relatives could have known. Said the investigating professor, quote, Rarely in the history of reincarnation has there been anything to equal this incredible case. Now what happened? 
In June of 1961, a woman named Gurdit Singh, 28 years of age, was fatally stabbed in the stomach by her husband, Surjit Singh. He was incarcerated in prison for a 10-year period for murder. The first sign that the slain woman had returned to life came seven years later, when the young girl, Rina Gupta, startled her parents with the statement about her husband and her murder. The little girl then pointed to her abdomen and said, I have a hole here in my stomach. She insisted she had four children and gave their nicknames. She stated that her husband in her former life had hurt his leg starting a motor scooter and became enraged at one time when she tried on one of his sweaters. On May 27, 1968, most of the young ladies, most of the uh, murdered woman's family visited the young girl. She was then three years of age. What happened was incredible. When the family entered the room, her face lit up immediately, and she recognized everyone, named the members of the family, and then traveled to the place of her previous life. There she identified her house, a picture of herself in her previous life, identified all of the things connected with herself that only that woman and those people could have known. Yet they lived hundreds of miles of, of, apart and the families never knew each other. The conclusion is quite remarkable. Two days after this visit, little Rena visited the home of Gurdip's parents and she recognized much of the inside of the house. That's when I knew for sure our dead daughter had been reborn in this child's body, said Gurdip's father, smiling at the recollection. The most astonishing part took place in 1971, ten years after the murder, when the dead woman's husband, Sergit, was released from prison where he'd been serving time for murder. When he heard about Rena, he was overcome by curiosity. He went to her house, the child's house, posing as a business associate, of her father to see if she would recognize him. The child, then six years of age, was terrified when she first glimpsed the man she claimed murdered her in her former life. He is not who he says he is, the little girl shrieked, clutching at her mother's legs, her eyes wide with fear. He's my husband, Sir G. Make him go away. He has come to kill me again. The stunned Sir G. did go away after revealing his true identity. Then there were photographs taken of the child and of the man who was allegedly her husband in a former life. Each step of the investigation was validated by the Indian Institute of Parapsychology. Over a six-month period of intensive investigation of both families who never knew each other. The conclusion was, I am convinced I am convinced beyond doubt that the girl and members of her family are telling the truth. I interviewed them individually on several occasions. I used complex interrogative techniques. I even tried to trick them. But on every occasion, the story remained the same. They were telling the truth, said Professor Banerjee. Close quote. Now, there are hundreds of stories not nearly as well documented as this in various newspaper accounts and the files of Psychical Research Society. What emerges from all this is hardcore evidence that something is going on that convinces some people that they have lived before. This, I think, would convince that child, her parents, the investigator, and anybody who went into it from a non-Christian perspective, that the child had indeed lived before. Now, what is the Christian Church's approach to the problem of reincarnation? Today, there are literally hundreds of millions of people who accept this as truth. We see around us 
cultists and occultists believing it. And we see continued evidence of great interest in it as a substitute faith. The reincarnation came to life in the United States during the revival of Spiritism in 1848. Then we had a great interest generated in the spirits through the efforts of Edward Stanton Moses, Moses Hull, and the Fox sisters. We had Spiritism in a great resurgence. In Europe, exactly the same thing happened in France, where mediums were communicating the same ideas about communication with another world. It's not a small point to remember that reincarnation is connected with the world of the occult extensively and almost exclusively. And therefore, when people talk about having lived before, we should begin immediately analyzing the background, the beliefs, and what precisely motivates the people who are involved in it. I think that the Christian Church has largely passed up this opportunity. Because of it, we have people today being swept into these movements, accepting these things without ever seriously analyzing precisely what it all means. In Taylor Caldwell's book, Dialogues with the Devil, and in Jess Stern's subsequent book on the subject of her lives, Search for a Soul, you have evidence of occultic power and the presence of satanic influences. Said Mrs. Caldwell, quote, If I were superstitious, which I am, of course, I should say that two personalities, Satan and the Archangel Michael, took over the book in mid-passage, but what they are, I do not know. Certainly the thoughts in the book are not my thoughts. Close quote. Jeff Stern, in his book, Taylor Caldwell's Psychic Lives, says that under hypnosis, she recalled many lives which she lived, describing them in great detail. And we find hypnosis connected with these things, and we find people constantly trying to get information about their past lives. Now, in order to analyze the case of the young girl, in order to analyze reincarnation itself, the Christian has to analyze it from Scripture and also from the evidence which we have about it. If we're not willing to look at it, if we're not willing to learn about it, if we're not willing to speak out on it, then the Christian church will remain silent while the world of the occult continues to grow. Our silence is always construed as weakness on our part. Every time the church doesn't speak, the world of the occult assumes it's because we either agree or because the church doesn't have any answers. The world of the occult looks down its nose at the Christian church's orthodoxy because they say orthodoxy doesn't answer them. I maintain that it is the task of the church not only to proclaim Jesus Christ as the Savior of lost men, but also to give to everyone that asks of us an answer, a reason for the hope that lies within us with humility and with reverence. And if we do it, God is going to bless us. If we retreat from the riddle of reincarnation, if we do not come to grips with it, if we do not answer it, then we capitulate in the face of a growing evil. And we are not answering the questions that people ask us. We are also backing away from the great and true biblical doctrine of the resurrection, which reincarnation directly challenges. Now, of all the tens of thousands of people who have been regressed hypnotically into so-called past lives, and there have been a lot of famous people who have done this, including movie stars such as Glenn Ford, there are some very basic characteristics which emerge from every single one of these things. Number one, the regressed subjects speak in a foreign language of which they have no conscious knowledge. This is a characteristic which is very common of spiritistic mediums. Now, this is quite significant. In the New Testament, we have the gift of tongues, mentioned in 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and 14, which is 
a language given for the praise of God and the edification of the church and a sign to the unbelieving world. But Satan duplicates the divine language with satanic vocabulary, and he does it through mediums who are in trances. It's very significant, then, to note that one of the things that frequently happens in hypnotic regression, when a person goes back into their past life, so-called, is that they begin to speak in a language which they do not know consciously. Secondly, the content of what they say when they reveal their past lives, their theology, is very interesting. They refer to God. They refer to Jesus. They refer to heaven. They refer to spirits. But they never, ever come forth with a declaration that Jesus Christ is the Savior. They never, ever acknowledge that there is one true and living God. They never talk about the cross as the remedy for human sin. And they never, ever acknowledge the bodily resurrection of Jesus Christ from among the dead. The content that comes through from people who are supposedly telling us about their past lives is always universally the same. It is hostile to the essential Christian message which we have in Holy Scripture. That cannot be overlooked in any analysis of reincarnation. Thirdly, the individual under hypnosis in regression usually is aware that they are not the one speaking. That's fantastically interesting. A person hypnotized, regressed to a previous life, speaks. Yet the person, when they hear the tape afterwards of what went on, is aware of the fact that they themselves weren't doing it. Repeatedly, the person says, Did I say that? I never said that. The I-ness, the identity, with what comes out under the hypnotic regression is quite revealing. It's missing in terms of the person being able to completely identify with that personality. They always talk about something else, someone else, some other force. And then, I think one of the most interesting things is the person is affected very strongly many times by the experience. Medical hypnotists tell you never to become engaged in hypnosis unless it's in the hands of a trained hypnotherapist or a medical hypnotist. Because if a person is regressed back you are going back through the memory banks in time. And it is possible, and it has occurred, that the person may reach a certain level, not be able to go back any further, and the person who is doing the hypnotizing, not being expert in what he or she is doing, may not be able to bring them back up again to the level they were at when they started. If you think the concept of going into a coma and lying in a hospital unconscious for a couple of years is frightening, think about being eight years of age again in a 35-year-old body for a while. That's more frightening. And this type of thing can occur under the aegis of hypnotic regression. Now, in the book, Many Wonderful Things, which gives a complete cataloging of hypnotic regression and attempts to penetrate the ideas of reincarnation, some interesting things develop concerning religion. Let me just give you a little recap of what people who go back into past lives say they believe, what the past life that speaks through them believes. There is not just one path to God. You can choose your own. There is no Satan or demons. There is no hell. There is no personal sin. We are all part of God. 
We shouldn't try to get others to believe in God. And the Bible is not the infallible Word of God. The unforgivable sin of Matthew 12, 31, 32 is indeed forgivable. Astrology is helpful, and God makes no requirements of us. Premarital sex is permissible. These are gleaned from hypnotic regression cases of alleged reincarnation. And what you are getting is the content, the theology, or the philosophy. And the philosophy coming through is anti-Christian, totally opposed to the revelation of Jesus Christ. This should begin to tell us something. Now, there are four different proofs that reincarnationists talk about. And I'd like to cite these because they're worth remembering. The first is intuitive recall. What is that? Vague memories and impressions that you've lived before. We've already discussed that. And it's perfectly explicable on the basis that the human mind plays tricks on itself. And you can be deceived by your memory impressions. Secondly, spontaneous recall. Detailed memories of children about a prior birth. So that a person under hypnosis can spontaneously recall all kinds of things which normally they would not be able to recall. A case like this a few years ago was known as The Search for Bridie Murphy. I don't know how many people ever read the book The Search for Bridie Murphy. But it was a real blockbusting bestseller. In that book we had the story that proved reincarnation. Reputable psychiatrists and psychologists attested to the truthfulness of the subject. A lady who under hypnotic regression went back to old Ireland in the 17th or 18th century. There she spoke Gaelic. She described the coastline where she lived. She discussed many of the customs and clothing. She spoke in Gaelic. She had a deep Irish accent. In fact, the book was so persuasive that they didn't even wait to finish all the research on her. They simply released the tapes that already existed and based the book on it. It was on a bestseller list for weeks and weeks and weeks, the search for Bridie Murphy. Finally, a psychiatrist found Bridie Murphy, began to check on the background of the woman. One of the psychiatrists wasn't satisfied. She was telling the truth under lie detector tests. And still he wasn't satisfied. So he began to examine all the evidence. It came to be a fact of common knowledge after a few months of intensive study that Bridie Murphy never existed, but was the figment of a child's imagination. This lady had spent many of her early years of childhood in the presence of her grandmother, who spoke Gaelic, and who had history books around her house about old Ireland. The child had steeped herself in reading these books, and Granny had taught her Gaelic. She forgot the language as she grew older and forgot the history books completely, but the memory banks recalled them. Under hypnosis, she regressed to when she was four and five years of age, and began to spew out in Gaelic everything she knew at that time period in her life. And it was so convincing that it was taken as absolute proof of reincarnation. Detailed memory of a child, spontaneous recall. And then there is psychic recall. Clairvoyantly obtained information. That happens when you get information through a psychic through someone who tells you, you know, you have lived before. And the person begins to communicate from the spirit what kind of a life you had, where you lived, what you did. And the person begins to listen to it and to accept it. Now these are the things that the reincarnationists and the hypnotists speak about when they are discussing the subject of reincarnation. Now I want you to take your Bibles and I want to appraise, first of all, reincarnation from a biblical perspective and then from a practical, analytical viewpoint. 
putting the two together, I think we can solve the riddle of reincarnation. In order to do it, we have to return to many of the relevant passages of Scripture which quite frequently lie neglected. I think the Christian should, in his and her analysis of the Scripture, concentrate in three prime areas. The first is the atonement of Jesus Christ. The second is the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And the third is the doctrine of eternal retribution or eternal punishment. So we take these three areas. Now, the purpose of all reincarnation, we are told, is to purge us of our sins. Why are people born maimed, blind, mentally retarded? Why do people have imperfections, physically and mentally? Why, says reincarnation, because in a previous life you sinned. You are paying for those sins now. The purpose is to let you suffer now to atone for the past. Cyclic rebirth, reincarnation, pays back the sins of the past. Now, Christian theology answers this directly. If you will, head on. We're told in the Word of God, Hebrews, the first chapter, that Jesus Christ is the soul, the total answer to all sin. We're told in Hebrews chapter 1 that God who spoke in times past to our fathers through the prophets has in the last days spoken unto us by a son or his son whom he has appointed heir of all things through whom also he made the worlds who being the brightness of his glory and the image of his person upholding all things by the word of his power when he had by himself purged our sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. Please notice that phrase. Verse 3. When he had by himself purged our sins. The word purge should be circled in your Bible if you have a King James Bible. The word literally means to cleanse. We get it from an old Greek word, katharizo. If you know anything about cathartics, you know that a cathartic is a purgative. Anybody that's ever taken castor oil needs no further description of its purgative capacities. This is the word that we are dealing with here in Hebrews chapter 1, verse 3. Jesus Christ by himself purged or cleaned out all sin forever by himself. It is not necessary for you or for me to pass through cycles of rebirth. You know, the old hymn puts it very eloquently. Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. Sin had left its crimson stain. Reincarnation washed it white as snow. That'll never fit there. It can't. Because the hymn is telling us that Christ is the answer. To all sin. He washed it white as snow. And he did that by the sacrifice of himself. The book of Hebrews is filled with illustrations of how the Lord Jesus Christ has paid the penalty for all sin. I'd like you to look for a moment at Hebrews chapter 8, which speaks of Christ's great sacrifice as the great high priest. Hebrews 7 again tells us that he is the one who possesses an unchangeable priesthood, an inviolate priesthood, Hebrews chapter 7, verse 24, and goes on to talk about the high priest of the tabernacle in Hebrews chapter 8. It's not till you get to Hebrews chapter 9 that you have the application of what Jesus Christ really did. Verse 11, But Christ, being come a high priest of good things to come by a greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is to say, not of this building, neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood, he entered in once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. What did Jesus do? He entered once, you ought to circle that in your Bible, one time into the holy place, 
having obtained eternal redemption. How much more, verse 14, shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal Spirit offered himself without spot to God, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? The Word of God is telling us in terms nobody can misunderstand. Jesus Christ has paid the penalty for all sin. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 12. This man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down on the right hand of God. And verse 14. For by one offering he has perfected, or the Greek says completed forever, for eternity, he has completed into the everlasting them that are sanctified or that are set apart. We know that without the shedding of blood, there is no remission. And Jesus Christ shed his blood, the just for the unjust, to bring us to God. Isaiah told us he was wounded for our transgressions, bruised for our iniquities. The payment for our sins was upon him. With his suffering, we have been healed. Identification, vicarious sacrifice or atonement. Reincarnation strikes at the heart of the Christian gospel by denying the atonement of Jesus Christ. You do not need any reincarnation or cyclic rebirth. Jesus Christ has offered the one sacrifice for sin forever and has eternally completed by his act of sacrifice you and I before the throne of God. This he did, Hebrews 1.3 by himself. You know, it's very interesting. The reincarnationist is always telling us that we go through cyclic rebirth and suffer in previous lives to atone for our sins. But you know, it's very puzzling that nobody remembers their past lives in sufficient detail to profit from them. So one doesn't know what one is being punished for. And if one doesn't know what one is being punished for, one is quite likely to repeat the offense. If reincarnation is really karma or the law of justice, as you sow, you shall also reap the definition of the law, why then, why not protect the person? Why not give them a full vision of what they have been before with all the flaws so that the corrections can be made? I cannot keep repeating the same thing and being punished for the same thing ad infinitum, ad nauseum, by a law that tells me it is trying to per perfect me. Rather, it is a law that seems to be turning me over forever on some kind of reincarnational cosmic spit until at length I arrive at the place where I have some kind of absorption into something. This is philosophically classic monism in which there is only one reality in which evil is negated. But the scripture tells us evil is real. It is the opposite of the eternal God. It exists by his permission but is real. One of the questions that reincarnationists have difficulty answering is, why can't I remember my past so that I can profit from it in the present and won't have to suffer for it in the future? This, of course, is a very reasonable question to address to them. Then, of course, there are other verses of Scripture which ought to be adduced immediately. For the Scripture also tells us that the destiny of the Christian at death is not cyclic rebirth, but to enter immediately into the presence of God. Philippians 1, 21 to 23 in your Bible is a good verse for reincarnationists because the Scripture tells us that the Apostle Paul, who went into the third heaven where no reincarnationist has ever made it to, and told us what was there, said, For me to live is Christ and to die is reincarnation. No. For me to live is Christ and to die is gain or profit. I'm torn between two things. Whether to depart and be with Christ 
Which is far better. Oh, depart and what? Be with Christ. Not be reincarnated. Which is far better. Or to stay here, which is more necessary for you. The Christian isn't looking forward to cyclic rebirth. The Christian is looking forward to being absent from the body. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. And at home with the Lord. Translated in the King James Bible, present with the Lord. But the Greek is beautiful. Absent from the body, at home with the Lord. With the Lord Jesus Christ. It's quite interesting that Solomon, who was called by the Lord Jesus Christ, the wisest man that ever lived, with the exception, of course, of incarnate wisdom, which was Messiah himself, wrote concerning what happens to a man when he dies. And most people completely forget about Solomon's wisdom at this point. In Ecclesiastes chapter 3, Solomon said, Who knows about the spirit of man that goes upward, and the spirit of the beast that goeth downward to the earth? And just so nobody missed his point, in Ecclesiastes chapter 12, the same man said, Then shall the body return to the dust from which it came, and the spirit shall go back to God who gave it. The destiny of man, according to the scriptures, is to pass from this life into the presence of God. To be judged. And the doctrine of reincarnation attacks the atonement. It attacks the concept of immediacy with the Lord at the death of the body. And it directly contradicts the great and true doctrine of the resurrection of our Savior. Resurrection or reincarnation, which was the hope of the early church. If you make a survey of the Synoptic Gospels, and if you study the book of Acts, which is the early history of the church, you will find that the theme resurrection emerges consistently. It is the great theme of the epistles. It is the constant theme of the early church. In fact, it is called by Luke the gospel of resurrection, the good news of resurrection. They went out and they proclaimed the good news that Jesus Christ was alive. He was not reincarnated. Jesus Christ came forth from the tomb in his own form and ascended into the presence of the Father. He is our great high priest, our intercessor, our advocate in the presence of God. The resurrection is your guarantee and my guarantee and the guarantee of all mankind that because he lives, we will live also. It was not a spirit resurrection, it was a bodily resurrection. It was not a reincarnation in another form, it was the identical form. And Jesus, to confirm it, said to Thomas, Put your finger into my hand, put your hand into my side, do not be without faith. Believe. To those who thought he was a spirit, Jesus said in Luke chapter 24, Handle me and see. A spirit does not have flesh and bone as you see me have. There is no reincarnation in New Testament theology. There is no reincarnation in Scripture as a whole. There is only the great doctrine Christ died for our sins and the glory of the resurrection. The truth that because he has risen, we too shall rise. He has abolished death and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. There are many passages. Psalm 78 verse 39 clearly states we do not return again. Not in this body. And Job said, I will be satisfied when I awake in thy likeness. What a wonderful reflection this is in 1 John chapter 3. It doth not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when he appears we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. In the resurrection we shall be like Christ. 
The blessed hope of the church is His coming and our union with Him. That we may put on immortality. That the corruption puts on incorruption, the mortal immortality. Now, there are a great number of passages that we could refer to on resurrection. But, inevitably, one must admit that Jesus Christ's death, the symbol for all men, is resurrection in his body, not reincarnation. In Acts 7.59, Stephen cried out, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. He was not anticipating as the first martyr of the church that he would be reincarnated. He was crying out to Christ whom he saw, standing at the right hand of the Father, receive my spirit. And who can look at Luke chapter 23, the thief on the cross, and not hear the words of the Savior, verily, verily, I say to you, this day you will be with me in paradise. What a marvelous opportunity to tell him that he could atone for all of his sins because that day he was going to be reincarnated and have another opportunity. And yet Christ never mentioned that fact to him. Simply that that day he would be in paradise with him. Now, Jesus Christ denied the law of karma. He denied that which governs the concept of reincarnation. In the ninth chapter of John, verses 1 to 3, where his disciples asked him a question. They saw a blind man and they said, Who sinned? This man or his parents that he was born blind? And Jesus answered, Neither one. I like that. That is an exclusive negation. Neither one. He's blind that the works of God may be seen in him. And with that, he healed him. And the man testified, Jesus was Savior. The whole concept of reincarnation is contrary to the Christian gospel, contrary to Jewish teaching. The Bible tells us now is the accepted time. Now is the day of salvation, not in the future. So when we talk about atonement, reincarnation denies it. When we talk about resurrection, reincarnation denies it. Yet 1 Corinthians 15 says, If Christ be not risen from the dead, your faith is empty. You are still in your sins. Resurrection is our hope. Our hope isn't floating somewhere on a cloud playing a harp for eternity as some have caricatured heaven. The hope of the believer is to be resurrected in the image of his Savior to see him as he is. And reincarnation denies categorically the glory of resurrection. And finally, the concept of judgment. The scripture tells us Hebrews 9, 27, it is given to all men first to die. Oh yes, but more than that. It is given to all men to die once. After this, the judgment. Not after this reincarnation. After this, the judgment. The biblical teaching is there is such a thing as judgment that's not tied up with cycles of reincarnation. We are told in Second Peter... The Lord knows how to deliver the godly from temptation and how to keep the ungodly under punishment until the day of judgment. The ungodly are under punishment until the day of judgment. But the Lord is delivering the godly. Now, the scripture teaches judgment on a specific day not a cycle of constant rebirth. And we are told in Acts chapter 17, God has appointed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness by the man whom he has ordained and has given assurance to all mankind by raising him from among the dead. God has provided for us salvation and he has provided for us the certainty that evil will be dealt with. To him that overcomes will I grant to sit with me in my throne as I have overcome and am set down with my Father in his throne. Our destiny is to sit with Christ in the throne 
And the scripture says we will judge the angels. Ours is not the destiny of cyclic rebirth. Ours is the destiny to rise immortal in his image, to sit with him, to be like him, for we shall see him as he is. But I'm sure that while I have been saying these things, enunciating the biblical doctrine of judgment, Matthew chapter 25, 41 and 46, surely speaks of cosmic judgment. These shall go away to everlasting punishment, but the righteous to life eternal. But going through your mind is the anecdote or story which I gave before. What about the case of the young girl who had all the facts and the information? What about all the details involved in that story? How is it possible for the Christian to answer those who say, here is evidence of reincarnation? I think there has to be a concrete answer given to it. And I don't wish to oversimplify in giving this answer. And I want to be as definitive as I possibly can so that nobody will misunderstand me. Now, you may not agree with me. I expect that. But you will not misunderstand me. Either the Bible is wrong... And reincarnation is true. Or the Bible is right and reincarnation is false. It is my conviction, based upon Scripture as well as experience, that God must be taken to be true and every man a liar. And if Phenomena and data and evidence and facts, so-called, lead me away from the truth of what God has revealed. I cannot accept that conclusion. Somewhere there must be another explanation. And it is my obligation to look for that explanation because in God's Word, the Scripture tells me that He has always left a witness to Himself. We are to look for it. The young girl was telling the truth. She did remember all those things. And every hardcore case of reincarnation that exists, I believe, can be explained as a person really telling the truth as they know it. I have no doubt about it. After you weed out the fraud, after you weed out the collusion, after you weed out the psychological explanations, after you weed out all of the memory bank tricks, after you get rid of all the explanations you have, there's a hard core that you have to admit occurred so far as that person is concerned. And the facts of checking it out indicate that they're telling the truth. It is utterly ridiculous not to admit that these things happen. They do. Our problem is the interpretation of the facts. Same facts, different interpretation. Granting the truthfulness of what the persons lived through and told about so-called previous lives. Where did they get the information from? The Bible says they didn't get it from God. And the Bible says... They didn't live before, otherwise the cross is meaningless. So somebody else is communicating information that can be reliably checked out. Somebody else has lived through all the ages. Somebody else can pick out case histories any place he wants and supply anybody with information about them anywhere he chooses. He has been in the business of deceiving the human race for thousands of years and he is still actively engaged in the business today. Jesus described him as a liar and a murderer from the beginning who abode not in the truth. And we know that he can rewire our brain circuits sometimes and that he can communicate with us through our spiritual natures and that he can penetrate our minds. 
You say, how do we know that? Very simple. He does it. And in the scripture, he did it. Case in point. Jesus is giving a discourse on what must happen to him as the Savior. And dear old brother Peter pipes up and says, Oh no, Lord, be it far from you. Roughly translated, that means, No way, Lord, don't let that happen. Never happen to you. Jesus turns to Peter and says, Get thee behind me, Satan. For you love the things of the world, not the things of God. And nobody in their right mind is going to claim that Peter was the devil. Nobody. But if you look at the passage, you will recognize the fact that Satan used Peter. Spoke through him and gave him the idea. He's a spirit. He spoke to Peter's spirit just as he speaks to yours and mine. And there's communication between our spirits and our minds. He gets from our spirit into our mind, just the way he got to Peter. And he lies to us and to anybody else he wants to precisely the same way. We are not, as Paul puts it, ignorant of his devices. So let's remember... This child could have received her information living in a pagan land dominated by religions worshipping the devil by the forces which govern those religions. And the information she communicated was accurate as far as she was concerned but a lie so far as the facts themselves were concerned. She never lived before never had been murdered, never had four children, never experienced any of those things. But the information was fed into her mind in such a way that she believed it. Now it is possible for the children of people who are worshippers of pagan gods to be influenced by the spirits behind those gods. We know, says Paul, that an idol is nothing in itself. There is no other God but one. And we are told that what the Gentiles sacrifice to, they sacrifice to devils. We are told in Exodus chapter 20 that God will visit the iniquities of the fathers upon the children to the third and the fourth generation of them that despise him. There is no greater despising or hatred of God in evidence than open idolatry. That, in fact, was his first commandment. No other God besides me. In India, where a great many of these cases develop, we find exactly this case in question fitting a pattern. Here is a child born of generations of people who worship false gods, wide open to the influence of those beings and influenced sufficiently to communicate information like this. Anybody who receives information of this nature, which is thoroughly verified, since it contradicts Holy Scripture, is receiving the information through the world of the occult and by the doctrines of the devils. And therefore, the Christian can rest assured that the source is Satan and the product, no matter how feasible and believable, is lethal to the soul. Satan's presence and power can explain every hardcore case of so-called reincarnation which exists. I don't see how the Christian can in any way turn from the Scripture to embrace what is so obviously contrary to what God has revealed. Now, I'm sure that there are people who will say, well, that's a simple solution to the problem, but what evidence do you have that will support it? The evidence that if Jesus Christ's word can be taken at face value, 
He is the Savior of the world. And if he is the Savior of the world, and the record indicates it, and men have experienced it and know it to be true, then there is no need for cyclic rebirth. He has atoned for all sin. If his word is to be relied upon, there is such a thing as eternal judgment. And men must face it if they will not turn in repentance towards him now. And there is such a thing as resurrection. The resurrection of the just and the unjust. And the Christian proclaims both. His hope is in resurrection from among the corpses, that he might stand one day whole and complete. We have been singing at Easter time. Jesus Christ is risen today. Alleluia. It's because he is a risen Savior that the message of the gospel has gone to the ends of the earth. Dead saviors don't send anything anywhere. Living saviors redeem the souls of men, heal minds and bodies, and bring light out of great darkness. Reincarnation can properly be called the gospel of the second chance. It is offering people eternal life on a cyclic scale. It is not ever offering them salvation, true reconciliation to a personal God. Let me conclude on what I think is an extremely positive note. Reincarnation has no personal God, only karma, the law of action and reaction. Reincarnation has no savior. Man becomes his own by cyclic rebirth. Reincarnation has no concept of real justice, for there is no judgment day. Reincarnation wants no part of resurrection. It is not necessary. You are constantly reborn in different bodies. Reincarnation is opposed to the great and true biblical doctrine to be absent from the body is to be at home with the Lord. And it stands forever opposed to Jesus Christ's authority. I am the way the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except by me. It cannot answer practical questions. It cannot come to grips with the fact that while it talks about doing good for mankind, tens of millions of people have starved and suffered and endured horrible persecution under India's caste system, simply because reincarnation held them in their case cycle after cycle, so that it was impossible for them ever to escape. Even today, people who still believe this doctrine in that land and other lands allow their children to starve and their nations to plunge into economic chaos. They will permit the rats to live and the beasts to live and the insects to live and the children to die. This is not in any way a reflection of the God who said, permit the little children to come to me, forbid them not, for of such is the kingdom of heaven. It does away with the dignity of man. It reduces him to impersonal origins. And we become not unique images of God, but instead nothing more than constant cycles retreaded from eon to eon, finding neither rest nor peace. To those who are in reincarnation, the gospel of Jesus Christ speaks forcefully and persuasively. Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you, learn of me. I am meek and lowly. You will find rest unto your souls. I am the way, the truth, and the life. Do not be afraid. Only believe. Shall we pray? Our Father, we praise thee and thank thee for thy word, for thy grace, and for thy love that will not let us go. Bless us and help us to see clearly 
the great distortions and evils in a system which turns against the person of thy Son and would have us become our own Savior rather than trust in him who is the Savior of all men, especially those that believe. Send forth now thy word through the presence and the power of thy Holy Spirit. Breathe upon those who are chained in this darkness, that they may see the glorious light of the gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, that he may shine to them, that they may be delivered from the power of darkness and translated into the kingdom of the Son of thy love. In Jesus' name, with thanksgiving. Amen.